Does your daily routine leave you lost in a sea of repetition? 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 Hendrix Gin invites you to leave the mundane and heed the call of your curiosity. Escape the conventional and embrace the delectable. Welcome to the world of Hendrix Gin. Oddly infused with rose and cucumber. Undeniably peculiar, utterly delicious. you guys are comfortable I'm gonna share a story with you. Once upon a time there was a very wealthy laird who ruled over Dufton from Balvenie Castle. The laird had an incredibly beautiful wife but his wife was filled with a deep sadness. No matter how hard the laird tried he could not bring her joy. Every night they would sit in their grand dining room at opposite ends of the table and share the finest meats, the finest cheeses, the finest wines hand selected by the castle sommelier. And still this did not make her happy. So one day the Laird decided, hang on, I'm gonna take my wife to the Dufton Cayley that happens every single Thursday night. Every Thursday night, all of the town would gather together to sing and dance. So they made their way down to the Cayley and sat in the corner and watched all of the townspeople dance. The Laird could not take his eyes off of one of his farmers, who danced all night with his wife with wanton abandonment. Their feet did not touch the floor every single dance, and two of them radiated joy. Now, by the end of the night, the Laird was rather despondent. His wife did not want to dance. So he decided to have a chat with the farmer and said to him, you know, you guys, you're working in the fields all day, you're tending your flock, you're growing your crops. Where do you get the energy from to dance like you danced all night? And the farmer replied, well, I don't know, every night we sit together at the table and we share the meat of the tongue. And then we have a dram of my whiskey that I've produced from my excess barley. And so the Laird says, well, please, sir, sell me a bottle of your whiskey. He buys a bottle of the whiskey from the farmer. He heads home and instructs the castle chef to go and find some meat of the tongue. The next night, the castle chef prepares an ox tongue for the Laird and his wife. And they sit down, share the meal with a dram of the farmer's whiskey. Still, his wife is filled with this deep sadness and he does not see her smile. So he, the next day, instructs the castle chef, find more tongues. So the chef goes out and comes back and prepares duck tongue, ox tongue, sheep's tongue, cod tongue, and they sit, share the meal, and a dram of the whiskey. Still, she's not happy. So the farmer, uh, the, the laird goes back to the farmer and says, look, what you told me, it didn't work. My wife's still unhappy. So the farmer said, well, um, I'll invite your wife to tea. Next Tuesday, she can come and she can join us at the farmhouse and share a meal with us. So the following Tuesday, she makes her way down to the farmhouse. The Laird waits impatiently at home. Soon he can't take it anymore and he rushes down to the farmhouse and peeks in the window. And he sees the room lit up with an amber glow. The three of them huddled around a small table with a humble meal sitting upon it and a dram of whiskey, full glasses. He sees his wife laughing and he couldn't believe it. So he knocks on the door, the farmer invites him in to join them. The four of them sit huddled around the table until the wee hours in the morning, sharing stories, sharing drams, and suddenly it dawns on the Laird. The meat of the tongue, it's not meat. The meat of the tongue, it's the stories that we share with one another. What brings richness and joy into our lives is the stories we share. You can have the finest food, the finest whiskey, the, the finest bottle of wine, and none of that will bring you joy if you don't have good company to share it with. 
Oh, thank you, Gemma. Thank you for that lovely story. Um, what a wonderful way to kick off our seminar for Tales 2020 on the topic of storytelling. Stories are so important for our industry. They connect us to people and places we otherwise would not have known. So thank you, Gemma, for that beautiful introduction. My name is Charlotte Voisey, and I'm the Global Head of Ambassadors for William Grant & Sons, and I am an avid Tales of the Cocktail fan. In fact, this would have been my 15th consecutive year at Tales. And why, while I terribly miss the people and the bars of New Orleans this week, I am delighted that Tales is able to carry on in a virtual format. So I'd like to introduce the panel to get started. And I'll start with our first storyteller who we've already heard from, and that is Gemma Patterson. Gemma is, uh, grew up on the Isle of Lewis in the Hebrides in Scotland. Gemma studied Russian at Glasgow University before falling in love with the craftsmanship of whiskey, where she joined the Balbeni and is now currently the global brand ambassador. So welcome, Gemma. Alongside Gemma, we have Wayne Curtis, no stranger to Tales of the Cocktail. Wayne is the author of And a Bottle of Rum, as well as The Last Great Walk, the true story of a 1909 walk from New York to San Francisco and why it matters today. Wayne is a contributing editor at The Atlantic, has freelance for The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal and others, and currently has columns with The Daily Beast, Garden and Gun, Imbibe, Spirited, and Wayne currently teaches nonfiction writing techniques at the John Hopkins University. Welcome, Wayne. Thanks. And our third and final storyteller is bartender Fernando Salsa. Fernando has bartended in New York, in Maui, in St. Kitts, and currently owns Hatchet Proof, a cocktail consultancy company, as well as Cocktail Carriage, a mobile craft cocktail pop-up bar service. Fernando is passionate about education in the industry and loves to join seminars and conferences just like this. So we're very lucky to have Fernando on the panel today. Thank you for being here, Fernando. Great, well, panel introduced, we're gonna kick off and I'm gonna hand things over to Wayne to start off talking about good storytelling techniques and to share some of the stories of our industry. Over to you, Wayne. Thank you, thanks uh, Charlotte, thanks for inviting me on this. And Greetings to everybody from New Orleans, where I live uh, most of the year, and you're missing the tails weather. I said earlier, it's supposed to be 92 and humid today with storms. So if any of you have been here, you know what that's all about. Uh, so let me start with the good news on the storytelling. We're in a golden age of spirits and cocktail storytelling right now. Almost everyone from brand ambassadors to dive bartenders know that a big part of their job is telling stories. Stories are what get the attention of customers. Bad news, there's a lot of really bad storytelling going on right now. Uh, and this was driven home for me about five years ago when I went to an industry event at a bar on the West Coast. And the presenting bartender, a man with enviable hair and expressive hand gestures, uh, was introducing a cocktail he'd concocted uh, with his, a sponsor's spirit. And he began with something like, I've got a story for you. And we all sat back and we waited for it. Um, I believe the story involved a beloved great aunt and lavender soap, maybe. Uh, Perhaps a couch or a porch was involved. I don't remember it all that much because it wasn't a very good story. It was flawed in multiple ways. Uh, it wasn't very interesting to begin with. Nobody mentioned it. It seemed very uh, fascinating or did anything really happen? It was like a theater performance where actors just sat on the stage without moving or saying anything, but just looking back at you. Uh, it felt forced. None of the connections with the narrator and the people in the stories, between the people in the stories and the drink they were uh, being served, and the drink or the ingredients in it felt natural. It could have come from a random story generator on the internet. Uh, and it was not believable. The bartender narrator didn't take the time to build any trust with us, which can be done in a number of simple ways through telling details, personal asides, and witty observations, preferably those that reflect poorly upon the narrator. Uh, no connection was built to invite us along for the ride. But the biggest flaw was simply the first. It was just, it was boring. It didn't hold any interest. It didn't make me intrigued about the drink. It went on for way too long. Uh, Mark Brown, who's the CEO at Buffalo Trace, some of you are likely familiar with him. Uh, he's fond of saying that everyone in the liquor industry is in the entertainment industry. Uh, although drinks are often served alongside food, we aren't in the food industry. Food is something everyone needs to eat to survive. Liquor and cocktails, not so much. Uh, the com competition for consumers' attention and cash are things, you're competing for things like Netflix and a night out at movies and concerts. Well, back when there were movies and concerts. 
Uh, making it entertaining means telling a story. If you're working with a brand, it's refining the origin story such that it's unique, compelling, believable. Uh, if you're a bartender, it's being able to answer even a simple question like, what exactly are bitters? Uh, and make it engaging and fun. Makes for a better experience for the customer and makes for a, a stronger bond between uh, you and the others. Uh, I'm pretty sure we all know friends who are natural storytellers and those who are not. Uh, someone could travel for a week to an exotic land and meet a troll who gives them a dragon's egg and they come back and you, they tell the story and you fall asleep halfway through it. But another friend could go to the drugstore for a pack of shoelaces and come back and tell marvelous adventures he, uh, he or she had along the way. Uh, in my few minutes allotted here, I'm going to give a quick overview about storytelling basics for those who feel they're not naturally gifted as storytellers. Uh, there are a few ways you can punch up your stories and, and draw in your listeners. Now let me start with a drink, this one. This is uh, Jerusalem Between the Sheets. It's sort of a variation of a maiden's prayer, which dates back to the 1800s. Uh, featured in Charles Baker's classic book, The Gentleman's Companion, which was uh, published in 1939. It's made with equal parts cognac, Cointreau, gin, and lemon juice. Um, to be honest, not that good, uh, which might be said for a lot of baker's drinks. They're a little unbalanced. This one seems a little bit confused, not as crisp and defined as a traditional between the sheets, which is made with rum and different proportions. The drink might not be great, but the setting Baker gives it is amazing. Let me read to you uh, some excerpts from the description that accompanies the drink's recipe in the book. We ran into it, it being the drink, one dank day of sleet and rain in early January, just after the first Arab Jewish riots, which started with the murder of a poor old man stoned to death in a Haifa melon patch, between halves of a soccer match that had just reached its climax beside the dome of the Rock Mosque, which has religious significance to both Arab and Jew, and unfortunately overhangs the famous Jewish Wailing Wall. We won't go into the politics of the thing, but it was a nasty mess with British Tommies in the streets finally and machine guns and barbed wire entanglements, all the modern civilized show. We were disillusioned at all this wholesale murder in Christianity's own heart city. We are worried at the thought of the drawn knives, the murder from ambush, which would follow all this blood debt being uh, throughout Palestine. We had both sinuses pounding. We were coming down with definitely something and in a weird, almost Egyptian looking sanctum of the King David Hotel, Weber, his friend, took charge with the following origination. And he goes on to, to describe the drink. Uh, that, that's just his lead into the drink. Note that there's nothing actually about the drink itself. It's all just context. He created a world for the drink. We look at some of the elements of storytelling uh, that he touches upon here. First, story should be about people. Two, should be filled with telling detail. And three, when possible, use the classic story structure of protagonist, obstacle, goal. Let me talk briefly about each of these. Uh, a story should be about people. Humans, uh, we're all hardwired to be keenly interested in other people, their motives, their foibles, their strengths, their fears. Reading other people and developing an understanding of what motivates them is how we as humans survive, it's how we evolve. 10,000 years ago, if you met a stranger on the plains, you needed to assess them quickly, friend or foe. If you lacked this skill, there was a chance one of you would leave the plains and it wouldn't be you. Uh, so Darwin favors those who can parse a story about others and learn from it. Uh, among the instincts that we're born with is one for detecting story. Just as we're evolved to have multiple taste receptors for bitter to warn us away from poison, we have an innate capacity to hear and understand narratives. Uh, so make the story about people. If someone asks you that question, so what exactly is bitters? You can give the Wikipedia answer. Well, it involves infusions of barks and roots and herbs and spices, or you can hold up a bottle. Uh, and say, you ever hear of a guy named Dr. Johann Sieger, a German who moved to Angostura, Venezuela in the 1820s and became Surgeon General for the Rebel Army? Or you can say, you ever wonder why this paper sticks up over the edge of the bottle like this? Uh, you've got their attention. Of course, if you're a bartender, it's gotta be a very empty bar and a very slow night to launch into that kind of tale. Fernando will talk in a minute about storytelling in more crowded bars. Uh, but no matter what you talk about, keep that people principle in mind. Two, and it should be filled with telling detail. Uh, the dreary story I heard at that West Coast bar that I started out with uh, was filled with bland and generic description. Uh, the more specific you can make it, the more vivid it will be. Uh, consider that Charles Baker description, which how he leads off with on the between the Jerusalem between the sheets, just filled with uh, detail. Dark sky of sleet and rain in early January, murder of a poor old man stoned to death in a hype of melon patch. 
Is there anyone who's not gonna listen to the rest of that story? No, I don't think so. Uh, he brings it to life with specifics. It wasn't just a dank day, but it was an early January and involved sleet and rain. It wasn't just that a man was stoned to death, which is horrifying enough, but it was in a melon patch. Uh, you don't have to layer on the specifics with a trowel like Baker does, but adding two or three details that bring something to life uh, can raise it above the bland and the plotting and, and capture somebody's attention. Third, uh, classic story structure of protagonist, obstacle, and goal. Uh, this is really the core of it. Uh, somebody has a, you're talking about a person, you're giving it a detailed setting, and then they have a goal that they're seeking, and there's something that's blocking them from getting that goal. That's where the hard wiring comes in. That's what we're uh, evolved to pay attention to. Um, classic story is when there's a character with whom we identify, has a clear motive, seeking that goal. He's being thwarted from that goal by obstacles. Uh, these obstacles can be really a, a variety of them. Uh, it can be uh, environmental obstacles, something's happening in the outside world that's blocking them. Think of you know, the book and movie, A Perfect Storm. Or it could be another person that's blocking someone from reaching that obstacle. Think of Neo and Agent Smith and The Matrix. Uh, or it can be an internal obstacle of being held back by self-doubt or a lack of courage. Uh, think of Rocky in the first of the Rocky movies. One of the better known teachers of storytelling and story structure is Robert McKee. He's a screenwriter turned screenwriting coach. He's got a book out called Story. It was published in 1997. It's been influential in Hollywood for years, and he's taught seminars all over the country on the elements of story. Uh, McKee spent years viewing hundreds of successful movies and analyzing them to suss out some of these shared elements, uh, what makes a movie work and what makes it, what, what good stories have in common. And what he's found is has a lot of overlap with myths and fables from long ago, uh, and basically found that ideas of story, theorists and psychologists like Joseph Campbell uh, sketched out years ago, he's been applied right up to the modern day. Uh, McKee talks about uh, a story beginning with an inciting incident. Uh, something that happens that sets a story in action and puts that protagonist up against those obstacles toward reaching his goal. So if you're stuck with coming up and how to tell a story, just think of a goal, an obstacle, and possibly an inciting incident. Uh, what sort of struggle did the person you're talking about face and how did she deal with them? Uh, I'll give you one example of a storyteller who uses this well in the spirits industry. I think he's a natural storyteller, though there are many. And that's Ron Cooper, who founded Del Maguey Mescal in 1995. If you've ever heard of the stories of traveling through the remote mountains of Mexico, trying to track down some of the small producers of mezcal, you'll remember them. Uh, dealing with washed out roads and suspicious characters and finding helpers along the way that can help him move forward and reach, try to find what he's looking for, which is extraordinary mezcal. With Ron, it's sort of one obstacle after another. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, just say the psychology uh, and the craft of storytelling could be a whole 10 week seminar, as I'm sure Gemma can attest, and she'll, she'll talk about some of the, the storytelling workshops that she's, she's taken. Uh, and we could drill down very deep into the, the, the concepts of storytelling. But if you just remember some of those essential elements, I think you've got a leg up on holding attention. Make it about people, use unique and telling details rather than bland descriptions, put an obstacle in the path of whoever it is you're talking about. Um, if you can work any of these essential storytelling elements into your stories, you'll be a step ahead and rather than talking about something generic and obviously made up. So look forward to uh, sitting across the bar from you one day or talking to you about your brand uh, and hearing those stories from you. With that, I will kick it over to Gemma. Thank you, Wayne. Just, uh, yeah, that's that's great. You're so right. There is, there is so many, first of all, everyone in our industry loves to talk, right? So we've got that going for us. Uh, but some people just have that gift for, for storytelling. Uh, but it's good to know that for those of us that maybe haven't, there are some techniques we can employ. And you're so right about Charles H. Baker. Um, when I first heard how wonderful he was, I would go through the, re went straight to the recipes. And I didn't quite get what all the fuss was about. And then you step back and you read the stories. And that's where his magic comes alive. So much so that when we did that infamous Tales party, I think it was back in 2013 now, with the help of Sinjin Frizzle, uh, a dear fan of, of Charles H. Baker, there was just so much detail in, in Baker's stories that we brought to life. And we made those the centerpiece of, of each of the bar experiences. So tons of good stuff in there. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, and Gemma, yeah, let's hand it over to you. Let's hear a little bit more about your experiences and your love of storytelling. Thank you. Um, thanks, Wayne. That was 
so interesting. There's definitely lots of lots of things that really got me thinking from from the way that you were you were talking about and sharing those stories. Um, and one one big thing is about that sort of evolution of stories, um, mm -hmm. how a story evolves over time, and that's something that through my own investigations and kind of interest in storytelling is really um, resonated with me. Um, when I first started as global ambassador with Balvenie a couple of years ago, I was sent on a bit of a mission to try and get to the bottom of the way that we had made a particular whiskey. Um, and it started off a factual note in our archives. So a record by our mashman that had said, um, we produced a batch of barley, um, produced a batch of whiskey from some barley using chocolate malt, signed Brian Webster, who's been with us for 50 years at the distillery. Now, I was living in New York at the time, and I proceeded to call Brian on the phone and ask Brian what he remembers, because we knew, obviously, that it was him that had made this whiskey. We wanted to try and get the, to the bottom of how he made it and why. Um, and Brian then proceeded to tell me in great detail exactly what happened how he remembered it very well that specific day it was back in 1992 it was on a drief day in july the 7th pouring with rain outside um, he recalled all of the smells all of the different sensations that he'd experienced at the distillery that day um, and then a few weeks later i looked at my phone and i had a voicemail I opened it, I listened to it and it was Brian and he'd said, Gemma, I've been thinking a bit more and I pulled out some stuff that I had at home. And um, actually he, then he added like more detail to what he'd told me originally. A few weeks later, I flew to Scotland and I was at the distillery with a colleague and met with Brian and said, hey Brian, tell us a bit about what happened back in that day when you made this whiskey. So Brian said, yep, it was pouring with rain. We had this batch of barley landed on our doorstep the raindrops I remember were dripping down my back. I had to grab every single sack of barley, 25 kilos heavy, carry it up, store it in our malt loft. Then the next day come in and make whiskey from the stuff. It smelled like roasted peanuts. It was really weird, thick black tar in the mash tun. Um, turns out this barley, it was chocolate malt used to typically produce beer. This was like a one-off thing that they'd done. But through several different iterations of hearing the story from Brian, he told it to me in a different way every single time. And then it dawned on me, right, okay, so we have this story, um, the same storyteller, and he's, his memory of that story was constantly evolving just as he was thinking more and more about it. And he was adding in every time he was talking to me, he was adding in more color and more detail. Um, and it was sort of my job to try and figure out, right, we had, we had the evidence um, down in the Mashin records of, from the archives of exactly what we'd used, but then we had to sort of, had to paint a picture to, to, to figure out how we were gonna communicate the process of, of how we made this whiskey based on Brian's story. And there was a few threads that really like resonated. So the things that he remembered so clearly, all the sensory stuff. So I guess like, like you said, Wayne, those things that are memorable, um, for Brian, it was the weather and the raindrops dripping down his back. It was the smells, so that roasted peanut note that he got when he was making this whiskey, it was the color, black tar. So they were kind of common themes throughout every time he told the story. And then his colleague, who was working alongside him at the time, chatted to him about his account and then built that picture based on, on sort of what, what they had both told me combined with what's in the archives. So we released this whiskey, we, we we put the whole story together, um, but I, it really got me thinking about that evolution of stories. So, you know, it's not just the storyteller, but it's like the stories that are passed on, you know, from all, all of our brand stories that are passed down and stories about our drinks that we're consuming from generation to generation to generation, they're really changing and evolving over time. And we have so much power, you know, in the way that we tell them, we're, we're greatly influencing those stories and the way that they're then consumed and the way that they're remembered. Um, fast forward two years and I was on a storytelling workshop where we were tasked to listen to a story. So everyone who was part of the workshop, we were each given one minute to tell a story to a partner. And so I was teamed up with our um, ambassador for the UK and she told me the story about when she was in Thailand 
and she was on a bus with her partner. He got off the bus, the bus started moving and they lost each other. Um, and then we had to move on and tell, retell that story that we had just been told in the first person to somebody else. And so then I'm retelling all one story as if it's my own. And I'm adding, I can't remember exactly what she told me. So I'm adding my own color, my own detail um, to that story. And now if you asked me what happened to Alwyn on the bus, Gemma, I, w I couldn't actually, that story is now my story. I, I, if, I taught, if I had to tell Alwyn that story, it, was, it would be completely different from what actually happened to her because I'm then filling it in with my own, my own experiences to slot in with, um, with hers. So that kind of, that workshop, you know, and that, that, that evolution of storytelling was something that really kind of sparked my interest. Um, the workshop that I'd done was with a group in London called the Embers Collective. Now, um, I had actually gone to see them perform in person um, at the vaults in London. And we had, the audience was sitting around the storytellers in a circle and we're, it's a basement location. So we're underground, we're all packed into this small room in a circle. And the first storyteller got up and she stood in the middle of the room and her voice and her story, she had everyone so captivated they were hanging on her every word. You could have heard a, pin, heard a pin drop in the room. It was like absolutely magical. And this was all just through her movement and her voice. And I was, you know, so impressed with how she connected with the audience. And by the end of the story, she had everybody up singing and dancing with her. And like, we were all immersed in this story. And she had like, you know, our imaginations all sparked by her words. It was something really magical and special. And I guess with my experience in sort of the brand world and working through Balvenie and we had as an ambassador, I had been on so many different, um, I guess, presentation experiences. So I'm sure we all have in some kind of way from school onwards, we're taught presentation techniques. And um, maybe we've been to acting classes, maybe we've had some kind of media training or something. But um, I really, this watching her tell the story, I wanted to learn how to tell stories like she did. So then I started to speak to the Embers Collective and we did a workshop for our ambassador team. And then after that, we did one which actually Fern joined with me um, for a group of bartenders that we brought to Bal Balveni from around the world. And so the way that they train and the techniques that they use is so empowering, right? Because the storytelling, I mean, it's something that's very authentic. You can be authentically you when you're telling a story and you can feel what you're feeling. You're not acting. It's something that's like you're, you're sort of unleashing from within. So <clears throat> I guess I'll talk to you a little bit about what they, what they have um, put together in their workshops and what we've experienced with them. They started talking about your body. So, you know, when you're, they were kind of, connecting you to so from when you're behind the bar you know you're as soon as as soon as a guest walks in you're telling a story with your body and how you're standing um whether you're whether you're kind of standing in an open warm welcoming way your body's telling a story about how you're feeling um so they got us thinking about being present and being present in our body then from there moving on to your voice so our voice has so much power you know if we're feeling anxious or irritable or frustrated um, or relaxed and warm, welcoming, that's going to come through in our voice. So then we, we've done a bit of work with them through <clears throat> how we're projecting our voice. Um, and then actually the language that you're using. So one of the interesting things that we did when we were um, having to retell our stories, we had to retell it in different ways. So we had to tell our story using very emotive language, talking about very um, focused on how we're feeling, um, using incredibly descriptive language and very factual. So, you know, dependent on, on you and how you want to relay that story, that language that you use is so important. And I think you touched on this a lot, Wayne, when you were chatting about the, the, the sort of color and the, the language that you use to describe things, that, that can be so memorable. Um, and then from language that, like, again, when you went into this in loads of detail, like that story arc. So, why are you telling a story? What do you want your audience to learn from that story? You know, we have so much power to teach people through our stories. We gain understanding of the world around us through the stories that we listen to and the stories that we consume. 
um, you have a power to teach somebody something, but then you also have a power, the power through your story to make people feel something. So, you know, we can, do you want to make, do you want to make people feel warm? Do you want to make them feel um, happy, scared? You know, there's, there's, it's um, something that like just through your voice and your story that you're telling that you're going to, you're going to, you have the power um, to make people, to move people, to make them feel something. Um, and then I guess thinking a lot about um, the way that you can tell great stories. So I really liked Wayne when you talked as well about thinking about your friends, like we all have somebody within our friend circle who is a good storyteller. So, I mean, I would encourage everyone sort of watching at home to think about um, going and doing some kind of course in story storytelling techniques. But if you can, there's a lot of inspiration that can be drawn from the world around us. So I think about my friend circle and I think about my friend Morag, who she can tell you a story about her tying her shoelace or going, to, going out for a walk. And she'll, I mean, she's one of the most naturally funny people and some of the detail that she adds in, you'll never forget that story. Um, so yeah, we can draw a lot of inspiration from the people around us um, and, the, and the stories, that, the type of stories that we consume because you know, from the podcasts we listen to, the drinks that we drink, the um, movies that we watch, the books that we read. Actually, when you break it all down, our lives are built on stories um, all around us. So there's a lot of inspiration that we can draw on. Yeah. Well, that's great, Jen. It's, it's so true. And I, I think what the point that you made towards the end there, it, great stories don't have to be about these mega important events it can be about the simplest thing but it's how the story is told and, and what it makes you feel right and I think if when we we jump in now to Fernando and talking about the role of storytelling for a bartender that's so appropriate because you're a bartender every single day some people are coming in to see you two three four times a week others you know once only so how you use the skill of storytelling to enhance the guest experience. It's really important. So high time we heard from a bartender. Fernando, what, what do you think about all of this? Hello, hello. Uh, thanks again for having me, Charlotte. Wayne, Gemma, amazing points. Uh, love listening to you, to you both uh, talk about your experiences in storytelling. And, um, and I'm happy to be here to share mine. So obviously my perspective here today is much more from behind the bar and how we weave all those techniques uh, and those arcs like Wayne, Wayne mentioned earlier to have a really intriguing and, um, and captivating story for our guests. Um, at the end of the day, my biggest focal point as a bartender is to make sure that my story or my storytelling isn't really impeding on their experience at my bar, right? Um, being able to begin a story and, and continue that story throughout their experience is something that I always try to do. There's no hurry, you know, as far as when the story can really arc during a meal or during a cocktail experience. It's really just something that's customizable. You really have to pay attention to those nonverbal cues you're getting from your guests, whether they're looking at their phone or they're in the middle of a conversation themselves, or they're looking at their watch because they have, uh, you know, a show to go see, uh, specifically speaking to me in New York, being, being where I am. Um, a lot of the stories that, that coincide with being a bartender in New York is current events. It's just something that happens on the way sometimes just to the bar. Uh, you're never going to guess what happened on the way to work today. You're never going to guess who I saw on the train today. Um, and suddenly, like Gemma actually mentioned earlier, a lot of the things that I've taken away from that seminar with the Embers is kind of adding my own twist to those stories, right? And, and kind of adding layers that may or may not have necessarily happened to exact detail, but it really elevates the story and it gets them a little bit more uh, involved and in, in, in kind of trusting me to to kind of guide them on this journey um so for me it's it's really about picking up the nonverbal cues and making sure that your story isn't the star of the show back to what wayne mentioned earlier the bar is our stage but not everyone necessarily is there to see your show they're there to really dictate what show they wanted to be a part of um, so it's really kind of getting them involved into the story and making sure that that they feel 
really, uh, really a part of what you're doing from making a cocktail, stopping, coming around to the other side of the bar, whispering a portion of the story in, into their ear that maybe not every other guest should be privy to or, or excusing yourself to go check on their meal or check, you know, their coat fell off their chair. So you have to stop your story short uh, and help another guest that's come up to the bar. So, you know, really picking up those cues. And one other point that I wanted to bring up is just the brand aspect of it. Um, I'm so happy to have had that experience with the Embers and with Gemma uh, because it's really added so many stories to my arsenal, specifically speaking to the Balvini brand in this, in this instance. I don't pick up any bottle that has that name on it without recollecting something personal that I've either heard or tasted through it with Gemma or with someone else that I can now pass that knowledge, that story, because every part of the story has that little bit of knowledge, whether it's the master blender or the master distiller, how this person might have spoken about it the first time I tasted it and this tasting note came to mind and where that tasting note came from was really nostalgic to her or him and how they grew up. And it really just ties that person into that spirit that they're drinking and they now feel connected to it. And that's my biggest job I feel like is just connecting them to what I'm, how I'm introducing it, what I'm introducing, and then making them so just interested in learning more about it. And it, you really just want to, you know, give them a glimpse of what else is out there because there's not enough time in a bar experience for me to tell you the history, for example, of the Tom Collins over and over and over again, uh, different renditions. I'm going to pick my favorite story behind the Tom Collins. And I'm going to tell you maybe even how it ties into a two block radius from where we're sitting right now. Uh, and really, so that when you leave my bar, you're going to take a left and go to that location that I talked to you about and be like, this is where the Tom Collins was created. Um, you know, be it, it could be, the, could be a different cross street, but it, it, it's around that vicinity. And that's what you're really trying to, to get that connection with the guest. Um, so for me, the story is, is everything. I'm probably not the best of the storytellers from a bartender standpoint out there, but I pride myself in being able to at least make the connection and, and give, the, give the guest the story that they're looking for, not necessarily the story that I want to tell every single time. So it's really, uh, it's really our job to just kind of reel ourselves in a little bit as bartenders and pick and choose wisely how you're bringing the story to life and making sure it doesn't really impede on, on, on their experience. Cause you just want to give them a little taste. I want these guests to come back so we can continue sharing stories, continue being able to listen to one another and not just them listen to me on a loudspeaker. I want to hear their stories just as much as I want to tell them mine. So learning about your guests and hearing everything that they've gone through is part of the story arsenal that you're going to be able to kind of continue to, uh, to evolve with and, and create so that you can share even more knowledge and even more little nuanced stories with, with the world, no matter where you bartend, Maui or New York or wherever. So, cheers. That's great, cheers, Fernando. And thanks for the Tom Collins there too. Um, you make a great point as well. It's of course, yeah, bartenders, great storytellers, part of the job, part of the toolkit. But it's also, you know, you have to kind of manage the guests telling you stories, right? I remember when I ran a bar in London, chatting with a regular once, and we were talking about one of my other bartenders, you know, lovely bartender, she's a great person, but she keeps, ru keeps running off every time I'm halfway through a story. This was the guest sort of telling to me. And of course, I'm like, that's good. She's checking on the food. She's answering the phone. She's doing her job. But of course, for the guests, they Sometimes they don't understand why a bartender can't just sort of sit down and hear the two hour version of, of their life story. Um, so that's another great skill you bring up of not only the gift that we have of hearing stories from guests, but also it's, it's part of the juggle, right? You gotta manage how you pay attention and, and, and give them the attention they deserve and they crave by coming in to see you, but at the same time sort of keeping all the other balls in the air, so but really important part of the role. And again, you know, like I said in the beginning, our, our industry loves to talk, right? Hospitality industry attracts great personalities, people that wanna share stories that have so much passion. And some are more gifted than others when it comes to harnessing that into a great story. But fortunately today, we've heard from yourself and Gemma and Wayne on some of the 
simple or you know te good techniques that we can employ just to make those stories a little bit more engaging um, and meaningful. So um, we've heard the joy, we've heard the impact as well of stories, and I just want to wrap up with a last thought, which is a little bit around the responsibility that we have as storytellers, but also as people who listen to stories, particularly in our industry. Consider, for example, the stories of Jack Daniels and Nearest Green, right? Jack Daniel, known the world over for one of the most successful, well-known whiskey makers, appreciated in his time, commercially very successful, able to amass generational wealth for his family. Nearest Green, same era, same town. Nearest created the Lincoln County process. Nearest Green was Jack Daniel's friend, mentor, teacher, taught him how to make whiskey. Jack Daniel was white. Nearest Green was black in America in the 1800s. It's more about the social context of the time than their talent with the still that is how their stories came to be and came to have been shared. We've only really in the last few years started to hear about Nearest Green and his contributions to whiskey distilling. So it's just a reminder that sometimes when we hear stories, it's not that they're not true, but they're always told from a certain perspective. They always kind of centralize a certain figure or a, or a certain way things were done. And I believe that now it's our responsibility to research a little bit more. Well, what was the social context of the time? And perhaps there were other people in those stories or there were other ways that those stories could have ended. Um, so it's just a little bit of a reminder to delve a bit deeper. And one person who's doing a great job to help us in this at the moment is Tiffany Barrier on her Facebook page, telling stories regularly, um, like, for example, recently on Mint Julep Day, when most of us are, you know, digging out our mint julep cups and uh, getting ready to watch the Kentucky Derby and enjoying a mint julep, Tiffany reminds us that pre-Civil War, 1800s in America, there were many very good black mixologists who were busy making mint juleps and creating the legacy of that drink. So it's up to us now to learn, and, and Tiffany lists, and I'll read them out, to learn more about the likes of Cato Alexander and Osamus Willard and William Niblo and Peter Brent Bingham and John Dabney and Tom Bullock and Miss Martha King Niblo. Let's, let's hear about them. Let's look for their stories so we can learn about the stories that haven't yet been told. And let's remember that some of the legacies that we're not privy to, it's not because the stories weren't good. Maybe the stories weren't passed along because the luxury of reading and learning to write were denied to many black people in America for a long time back then. So their stories were never able to come through. So let's, let's do the work and let's learn about them. Um, and let's celebrate some of the lesser known uh, heroes of our industry. So normally at this time, I would thank everyone for coming. I would ask you to stay cool, enjoy the rest of Tales. Um, right now, I'll just give a massive, massive thank you to Gemma, to Fernando and to Wayne for your excellent contributions. You clearly have both expertise and passion in this topic. Um, and thank you everyone who tuned in. I hope you enjoyed the session on storytelling. And moreover, I hope to see you all in person next year in New Orleans at Tales of the Cocktail. Thank you.